All right, Wish, thanks for doing this. And I just got to say, you and I have had the monikers that I feel like we both probably wish we could shake. You going back to your puck daddy days and me going back to my bro dog days. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> the puck daddy thing, you know, the 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 blog. I realized pretty quickly that uh, the the blog was going to be much like uh, how everyone calls Doctor Who Doctor Who. Like I was going to be known as the puck daddy. Uh, I, I've I've told the story before, but the original name of the blog was actually the Zamboni Pony. That's what my my editor wanted to call it at Yahoo. He wanted to call it the Zamboni Pony. And uh, I remember saying to him, I, I said that that cannot be the name because I guarantee you I'm going to do like radio hits in Canada and there'll be like joining us now on W blah, blah, blah in Winnipeg. It's the Zamboni pony himself. I'm just like, nah, it's not going to be my life. So Puck Daddy worked out all right. And and now it's been resurrected at ESPN when I do uh, uh, sports wagering content. They like calling me Puck Daddy. I think it, they, they think it's like a, I'm a guy with a cigar in the back room given uh, given picks or something. So they, they bought it back at, e, at ESPN. I couldn't be uh, happier. Good radio voice, by the way. I just want to throw that in there. It was, it was, you, you, you could have a job in this business, I think. Uh, speaking of the NHL, um, Minnesota is obviously making a wild case, if you will, for Brock Faber to be in the, the Calder conversation. But man, just looking at Connor Bedard, I know he missed some time and I know he's on Chicago, but is there any way Connor Bedard doesn't win the Calder this year? Well, that's just it. I mean, like, it feels like it's been predestined before the season. Our, our new awards watch, which uh, chronicles what the actual voters are thinking, we we get like the ballots from around 25 to 30 voters um, it will be coming out later this week on ESPN. And, and I'm interested to see exactly where the voting falls because, you know, Bedard's numbers offensively are, are great. Um, obviously, he missed all that time due to the broken jaw. Uh, you take that into account as well. Defensively, uh, well, there's always next season, but that's <laughs> fine because he's on the Blackhawks and they don't play defense as a team. Everybody's a minus the over Faber, there. <laughs> right. But the Faber thing is kind of interesting because on the one hand, it's undeniable what a great season he's had uh, playing the minutes he's played. I mean, he looks like a season pro out there. His his numbers are strong. And, and I do feel like there's a certain sentiment of, you know, this kid pound for pound might be the best rookie this season. Mm -hmm. And I want to throw my vote this guy's way because I feel like he needs to overcome the hype machine that is Connor Bedard. Like, I, I feel like there might be that level of sentiment there. We've seen it for the last couple of months where there's been growing support for Faber to the point where it became a dead heat, I believe, last month for the Calder. Uh, we'll see where the voting uh, falls this time, but it, it wouldn't shock me at all to see Faber pull this thing out much in the same way that you know, Connor McDavid lost the call during his rookie season to Panarin when McDavid lost a bunch of time to injury as well. Well, not to make this an award show preview because we still have, you know, the entire playoffs to talk about. Um, I feel like the Norris Trophy is getting old. It just goes to the defenseman <laughs> with the most points or goals or whatever offensive output by the end of the year. Do we almost need to do it like a forward for defensemen where we say we have like a defensive Selkie, like a, a best defensive defenseman and a most talented offensive defenseman? Can we do that? Well, I don't, you know, I've all always been a, a fan of the idea of honoring the best defensive defenseman. I think back in the day, I might have even pitched it as the Rod Langway Award, just to put a, <laughs> a time stamp on how long I've been making this argument. Wow. But to me, the thing, I, I don't want to see the Norris split up into best offensive defenseman and best defensive defenseman. I think what I'd rather see is keep the Norris as it is, which is theoretically the best all around defenseman. And then you create a second award for best defensive defenseman, kind of the Selkie trophy for defensemen. So that's when you get your, your Jacob Slavins and your, your shutdown D men, your Devon Taves and players like that, that might not necessarily have the luster or the offensive numbers to win the, the Norris, uh, but could be honored with another award, but keep the Norris as is, man. Yeah. I mean, and, and the Norris, again, not to make this awards preview, but like the thing I'm really interested <laughs> in is to see how much, headway Roman Yossi has made in that race has been as being kind of like the focal point of that crazy Predators run after they were deprived of joy and not being able to see you two at the Sphere in Las Vegas. We all know the story by now. They got that taken away from them and, they, and then they won like all their games after that. Uh, Yossi's been the guy that's been credited with a lot of that run. And uh, it's been the Quinn Hughes versus Kale McCarr show for the entire season with Quinn Hughes basically having a stranglehold on that award for most of the run. I'm really interested to see if Yossi is A, moved into the top three 
and then B, if he's maybe even surpassed one of those guys in the voting. Yeah, and it's uh, it's so much of a more difficult award to figure out when you don't have a 101 point defenseman like Eric Carlson <laughs> last year. There's no shoe in necessarily, but I agree. Uh, Roman Yossi doing it for a long time. Great to see him kind of reemerge like but, in that conversation. But even Carlson wasn't a shoe in. I mean, Carlson right. had his share of, of detractors last year yeah. in saying that, like, look at his usage, look at the all offense, no defense play. Right, he's on like, the sharks. Even in that case, right. yeah. You know, the, the Norris gets that rap from people of being like, oh, it's just whoever has the most. I saw there was a writer in Edmonton that's like, whoever has the most points win the Norris. Well, that it, that's yeah. true in some cases. But in a lot of cases, there's always sort of the uh, other side of the story of, well, this guy has all the points, but he doesn't have all the defense. Look at this other guy. He's like three points behind him, but he plays a total game. And that's somehow the sometimes how the Norris trophy voting goes. We've got hot teams down the stretch. We've got top teams down the stretch who are the best teams down the stretch in your opinion that are best built to make a stanley cup playoff run or, or stanley cup title run so that's that's an interesting point of delineation on, for that you've made there because like i feel like you know the rangers have been one of the best teams down the stretch but i don't think that they're the team best built in their division right. to win the cup right so like I, the the answer to that question is the colorado avalanche and the carolina hurricanes and both of those teams made pretty significant upgrades at the trade deadline. Colorado getting Casey Middlestad from the Sabres, getting Sean Walker. Um, and obviously the way McKinnon's been playing, it looks like a steamroller. And they look like every bit a, a Stanley Cup contender once again in the Central Division. Um, Carolina may not win their division. That might actually behoove them uh, to get to that 2-3 series <laughs> yeah. in the Metro Division. Right. But when I look at that team, you know, and the way that things have gone in the playoffs for them in the last several seasons under Rod Brindamore, it's always been a case of they don't have that player to score a critical goal or create a critical goal <laughs> at, a, at, a, at, a, at a time that they need it in a playoff series. They lost a series of one goal games to the Florida Panthers last year, for example. And like Jake Gensel is a point per game player in the playoffs. And I know that there are a lot of people out there that are like, he's a product of Sidney Crosby. It's a fair point, but now you see him on Carolina and he's killing it. And, and I think that in the playoffs, he's proven to be a viable scorer, the likes of which the Hurricanes have needed. And then if getting Kuznetsov, like his overall numbers for the Hurricanes since coming over, not been all that impressive on the defensive side of things, which is kind of hard to do when you play for Carolina. It seems like everybody's got good defensive numbers on Carolina. But offensively, we've seen him create some chances, create some goals, and do some scoring himself that I think is going to transfer over to the playoffs as well. He's always been a dependable playoff performer. Uh, so Cal Colorado and Carolina are the two teams that I think have done the best since the trade deadline insofar as showing me that they, their makeup might be good enough to win the cup this year. And I just look at the standings. I mean, Vancouver tape to tape is going to be one of the best teams in the division and out West, but I just don't know yet if, you know, getting past round three in the conference final, I don't know if that's for them. We'll find out, I suppose. Um, I want to run a well, theory. Oh, go ahead. Let me, let me on the connection real quick. Like yeah. the thing that I think a lot of us are curious about, they they seem to remind me a lot. Remind, remind me and remind a lot of people of the Devils last year, mm -hmm. a, a team that maybe is doing this playoff thing for the first time in yeah. a lot of cases. The pressure of being a front runner, and and so what happens when they meet Vegas? Right. What happens when they meet the Kings? What happens when they meet one of these? old school veteran teams that know how to win a playoff series by playing stifling defense, right. whether it's Vegas and the way they played all of last postseason or the, Avs. or the Kings now in this, in this sort of like, uh, you know, defensive system they're playing with their new coach. It'll be interesting to see what happens when Vancouver runs up against one of those teams. I want to run a theory past you. There's only 36 to 38 NHL head coaches and 32 of them always have a job. The other five, four, five, six are just waiting for their turn in their next job of, of musical chairs. Is the NHL a little bit too circular in its coaching community? Like, have they never branched out a little bit? I feel like it's the same names and faces year after year. It is. And and that's there's two reasons for that. The first is hockey nepotism, yeah. which is that uh, you are my friend. We used to play hockey <laughs> right. together, and now I'm going to hire you to be my coach. You saw that with the Devils and, and bringing in Travis Green to replace Lindy Ruff. Travis Green and Tom Fitz, Fitzgerald were teammates when they played uh, in the NHL together. So you see a lot of that. 
And then also, you know, there's the comfort of the known versus sticking your neck out and trying to hire the unknown. And, you know, a lot of times a player, a coach with that's a proven commodity is going to get another chance before a guy in college or a guy in juniors or an assistant coach. And, you know, this season has shown that, you know, taking a chance on somebody is, it could pay dividends. You look at Spencer Carberry with the Washington Capitals. Yeah, a lot of that is the product of of better than expected goaltending from Charlie Lindgren. But he's also found a way to, you know, integrate young players into a veteran lineup and and, and the team has thrived. Um, you know, I think thinking outside the box with younger coaches, thinking outside the box with coaches that don't have the commiserate NHL experience um, could pay dividends. It just it just takes a good amount of bravery yeah. to do that. And a, a lot point. of GMs don't necessarily want to put their, their selves on the line like that. Let me ask you about expansion. Everybody talks about it from a business standpoint, what market would work, this city, that city, how are the Coyotes or Jets even doing? But how about from the actual hockey talent perspective, would the NHL jeopardize maybe dilution if there is expansion past 32 teams? No. And the reason why is because from what we've been able to see from the expansion draft rules that Seattle and, and Vegas had, mm -hmm. the end result is we have higher scoring levels now than we've had since like 93, 94. Does that mean and, though and that it's better teams, better play, or just less, it less matter. defense? <laughs> it, it doesn't, I don't care about better teams. Like okay. we already have forced parity in the league right. where the salary cap creates conditions in which everybody is kind of the same outside of some, you know, teams that are clearly built to be in the draft lottery. Right. Um, but if the end result of this dilution of talent, and by the way, I mean, dilution of talent with the asterisk of we've never had a stronger pipeline of talent coming into the league, whether it's internationally, NCAA hockey, like we're, we have a constant stream of good young players. And oh, and by the way, the way that, that the NHL is played now, where it is no longer a, a, a league of obstruction and you know, fourth line guys pounding the crap out of people. <laughs> and it's all about speed and agility, like undersized players that might not have found a home in the league a decade ago can find a home on teams. Now yeah. the bottom line for me, the Brody's like, if the end result is we're going to have increased scoring levels, players like McDavid and Matthews chasing the history books. Um, that's only a good thing. Yeah. And, and, and I don't consider it to be a negative if the end result of, of expansion by you know two more teams we is we see more five four or, or six five games because you and I both know that like the two things that are the easiest sell to an American fan are rivalries yeah which we don't really have anymore in the NHL yeah. I hate to tell you uh, and 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 offense yeah scoring and goals. we've got offense in spades right now and I think it it makes it easier to sell hockey to an American audience I'll combine the last league based question uh, two questions actually into one. Pittsburgh, obviously, kind of going through a San Jose Sharks experience where they were loaded. They've got older players, heavy on the contracts. And obviously, you've got Sidney Crosby. That's all he's ever known. That's all he's ever been. And if they go into a rebuild and Sid's only got a couple more years, so this is the first half of it. Could you ever see Sidney Crosby wearing somebody else's sweater? On the other side, you got Ovi sitting within 50 goals of catching Gretzky's record. Look, I think he can play two more years. I think he'll play what that'll put him past 40 just a little bit. Um, how close? What does Ovi need to do to get to Gretzky? And will Sid ever play for anybody else besides Pittsburgh? Well, let me do Ovi first. I talked to Brian McClellan, the Caps GM, the other day, and I'm like, were, were you sweating a little bit early this season when you saw a Vetchkin's goal totals, man? Did you Struggling. Think that the guy finally hit the wall. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, I was sweating. I, I was a little bit nervous <laughs> that, you know, this guy that would get so close to Gretzky's record and we were going to, you know, market, you know, the next two seasons of Caps hockey around the record chase all of a sudden wasn't scoring goals anymore. But obviously he's pulled the nose up on the season. He's he's, he's finished really strong for them. Um, and, and the Caps have shown that they've built a decent team around him to be competitive. And that's all Ovechkin wanted when he resigned there. He's like, if you build a competitive team around me, I can break this record and we can challenge for a playoff spot. And so far, so good. So I, I think he gets it. I think he gets the record and it's going to be really one of the more remarkable moments for the the NHL in the US in particular in, in quite some time to the point of like we're going to get the kind of attention that baseball got for home run record chases yeah. or like the Ripken consecutive games record like this is a record every casual fan understands it's Gretzky Gretzky it's yeah. goals yeah. and Ovechkin is a player that is not unknown to the casual fans so right. it's going to be a real seminal moment for the league as far as Sid goes like 
I've long thought put him on the avalanche with his boy McKinnon and away we go. But every <laughs> single person I talk to in Pittsburgh that knows Sid, that's been around that team, tells me he's not going anywhere. Mm. Like it's not going to be mm. Kane and Taves in Chicago. Uh, it's going to be a situation where he re-signs with the Penguins. He is there through a rebuild. Wow. And the hope is that he is still a viable player when they start to trend back up the standings so he can win again in Pittsburgh. And And I take it, I take them at their word. Yeah. Like I, it doesn't make sense to me. He's such yeah. a competitive guy, but they'd say that that him retiring a penguin and him uh remaining with that franchise is is paramount to Sid. Well, wait until he's actually in the rebuild as now somebody I can say that I uh, like understanding what the Sharks are going through. Wait until he's right. in the rebuild. He might feel differently. I'll I'll give him the benefit of time on that. Uh, speaking yeah. of that, by the way, I tried to have Jeff Merrick come join me. He's apparently he's too busy. Uh, that was my number one choice, but I'll I'll take you wish. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. I had to get a chirp in somewhere. Uh, but you were talking to Merrick on on Sportsnet the other day, and this caught everybody's attention here in San Jose when you casually dropped in. Hey, we're talking about GMs of the year. I'll put Mike Greer in that category of GM of the year. And, uh, ears perked up, eyes were like, wait, what? Maybe that shouldn't get some of the double takes, and maybe he is a bit of a sleeper. I mean, you you use the quote here, pruned fairly large contracts and got decent returns. So maybe yeah. maybe if you would, just explain that one more time and, and why you still sit on that, that position. I'm a big, strict constructionist of awards criteria, especially when it comes to like the Hart Trophy and most valuable to his team. Like... Uh, anyone who's read me through the years knows that I've gotten myself in trouble with with certain team with cer- certain fan bases <laughs> regarding you got to be in the playoffs to win the Hart Trophy. That the is the only way we can assign value in this league right. is whether your team is a playoff team or not. Uh, there is nothing in the wording of the General Manager's Award or the Jim Gregory General Manager's Award, which should clearly be called the Lula Amarillo General Manager's Award. But that's a debate <laughs> for another day. Um, there's nothing in the language that says it has to be success. Or, or that the team needs to win the cup or or win two rounds of the playoffs. They do the voting for the award after two rounds of the playoffs. It is simply, simply the the general manager that did the best job. Yeah. And who has done a better job in uh, understanding the assignment and completing it than Mike Greer? Like he, he pruned, uh, like I said, contracts on the roster. Uh, he got decent return for them, um, and and he has created helped create a roster with a goal differential that is nearing minus 200. <laughs> so like, you know, if, if the assignment is maximize your draft lottery odds, get rid of some of these contracts that are clearly not tenable for the franchise anymore and and transition this team into a a fairly deep trench of rebuilding. He's checked all like, the boxes. He's checked all the boxes, exactly. Yeah. So now... <laughs> It's not a perfect candidate. Right. Uh, I don't like the idea that the three uh, salary retention spots for the Sharks mm-hmm. are spoken for for next season. That's a faux pas. And I certainly think that in some of the trades that he made, the return could have been could have been better. Um, but, you know, you do what you can with the contracts that, that you have on your roster. And uh, and I think he did OK for himself. And more importantly, the Sharks will barring something really weird happening, uh, finish the season with the best odds of drafting uh, Macklin Celebrini, which is really the thing the franchise needs at this point, which is to understand and have the fan base understand what the next thing looks like. Which you say best odds, which means finishing with the league's worst record. Now, that brings me to the next topic here. Sharks fans were kind of in this boat last year as it went down the stretch. They ultimately finished fourth worst record-wise in the NHL. Is it prudent for Sharks fans or any fan base in the league to actually be okay with finishing last or to kind of hope that happens? Because in the end, you still only get, what, a 25% chance at picking first, in this case, getting Macklin Celebrini? It's not a lot. No, I mean, they, they, I understand that thought. And I mean, the NHL has put in anti-tanking measures a lot to yeah. make it harder for teams to be as bad as the Sharks are and really maximize their draft potential. But I mean, that's still a one in four chance of getting yeah. a guy that is going to be a franchise player. We, we had uh, Rachel Dory, uh, an NHL draft expert for ESPN on our <laughs> podcast, The Drop this week. And she she said that, you know, he is going to be a, a Nathan McKinnon-esque generational scorer maybe not wow. generational player like mcdavid or bedard but but a, a guy like mckinnon like matthews that is going to put up incredible numbers in this league and you know you have to maximize your potential of, of landing that player and 
you know, you do it within the confines of the rules the NHL has created to try to discourage tanking. Um, and, and you kind of go from there. I'm, I'm, oh, I'm a pro tank guy. Like, I don't care. Like if you want to tear down your team and tear down your season in service of trying to draft uh, a, a player that you know is going to make you good for the next dozen years, by all means do it. Absolutely. I, I feel like all of this hand wringing about, oh, you shouldn't have people root for their team to lose. Well, they're going to lose anyway. Who cares? Get the like, consolation it, prize. It's out there. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. fans aren't stupid. Right. They know the, the Sharks are not going to be a competitive team. Right. So the idea that you're going to maybe like root for them to lose more than they're already going to lose. Right. Who, who, if, if it's in service of then turning the corner and making this team and this franchise viable again, then it's it's all worth it. And, not- and, and it's. And at the end of the day, it's a gamble the teams are making that the fans are going to be along for the ride. They're not trying to be here year after year. This is one thing that's going to boost them out of it. It's a lot of pearl clutching. You know, oh, how dare you think that they you don't want them to get points at the end of the season? Like, it's actually in the long-term best interest. I've said this. If you love the Sharks, and I do, this is what's best for the future of the Sharks. And I I know not right now, and I know no player and no coach on that team right now is going to want to hear me even say that. But honestly, for the long-term future of the franchise, that's probably what's best. What do you make of, of the current build of the Sharks? And obviously, uh, Zetterland and Eklund, and I, I really like Mackenzie Blackwood uh, in goal. I'm sure you saw enough of him in New Jersey. Plus, I think their pipeline with Will Smith, with a Quentin Musty, and maybe with a Macklin Celebrini, like, they're definitely doing enough things that put me feeling like this will go well eventually. Don't, don't, don't fall for Blackwood. Don't, really? Don't, don't get... Ch- don't get charmed by his. He's been his, great here. His brief, his brief moments of, of competence. I'm not, I'm not a Mac Black fan. Um, but, but then again, you know, <laughs> I haven't maybe, used that one. Maybe yet. I, maybe I should be based on how terrible the Devils' goaltending was. Come here. on, uh, the guy, are you serious? The guy, I'm not, a, I'm not a Blackwood guy. What do you really? want to say? I, I don't know. I watched him play in Jersey for a really long time. Now, granted, every goalie has a different trajectory, and maybe he does figure it out at some point as yeah. he gets older. And I know his numbers have been all right, but like I don't know, I've been, I've been, I've been down this road before. I've been charmed by this guy before <laughs> okay. as a right. as a Devils fan, and I've I've only been disappointed. The guy that I'm really excited about is Will Smith. I, yeah. I recently wrote a story about the BUBC uh, feud in college hockey and the idea that those two teams could meet for the championship for the first time since 1978. And I, I talked to Will Smith. I think he's a really, really good, smart. Like you said, the hockey IQ is off the charts. Yeah. Um, really creative offensive player, like really, really good player to have in your system along with some of the other names that you mentioned. So they're, again, they're, they're building the foundation, right? It, 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 they've got a couple of pillars in place, but the thing that's really going to allow them to, you know, construct the mansion is Celebrini. And, and that's, I mean, that's what, as a, if you're a Sharks fan, you got to be super excited about the opportunity to maybe win the lottery. Um, and don't be too bummed if you don't, because yeah. there are some other, Really good players, not franchise level, but really good players at, at near the top of this draft as well. I was going to say, and that's the last thing here, as we look at winning the lottery or not, and whoever the Sharks get in a draft pick or not, does it change how long this is going to take? Could Celebrini truly accelerate the process? And and with or without Celebrini, what are you maybe aiming at in terms of when the Sharks could be back to annual playoff contention? Like how many more years in your mind? I don't think there's another player that's the accelerant that Celebrini is. I think Celebrini could have the same kind of 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 impact in year one that Bedard had for Chicago, but yeah. I think that the Sharks have more functional warm bodies on their roster and in their system than do the Blackhawks. Yeah. So it, the, the turnaround could be a, a little bit quicker than maybe it is for a team like Chicago that really tore the thing down to the to the rivets. Um, but you know, I. What is it? What are we thinking? Like three years, maybe for a, for for a turnaround? Get these kids. It's already been five with, NHL. five with no playoffs. You know what I mean? So you add another three, and you're thinking, wow, that's that's going to be a while. It's a long road ahead. Yeah. But I mean, you know, the the team the team made some contractual decisions. Yeah. Based on trying to remain viable yep. with the veterans that they had on the roster, and it didn't work. And and you know, it, it takes time to to change over the roster, to figure out what the next phase is going to be. It gets easier when you have a guy like Celebrini at the top of the pyramid. But look, man, I, I you know, we've talked before, like I, I've lived in, I lived in the Bay Area for a couple of years, yep. I lived in Campbell, shout out Campbell, <laughs> lovely downtown. Yep. Uh, and, uh, and, and I got to see the, 
the the tail end of of the mania surrounding this team and it was clearly you know like post Thornton post Marlowe post you know cup final appearance and 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 it, it's it's a bummer for me to not see a viable San Jose Sharks franchise right now to not see the excitement to not see the tank filled yeah. to not have that team be uh, relevant um, because it's important for the league, be, to be honest with you, for, for that franchise to be relevant. I think they they have a very strong, passionate following that can move the needle in the Western Conference in ways that a lot of teams don't. I think their viability within the context of the Battle of California is important. I mean, look at look at the Ducks and the Sharks and how that whole thing is atrophied because you only have one team that's good right now. Right. Like it's important for the Sharks to be good, and it's important for that franchise to get good as as quickly as possible to re-energize the fans. And uh, and hopefully it happens. So hopefully, hopefully there's some lottery luck for that team because I think if they get Celebrini, it'll happen sooner than later. You've been doing this a long time. I've been following your work for a long time. I think this is the first time we've chatted like this. So I uh, wish I really appreciate it, man. And, and hopefully we can do it again sometime. And I, I wish you the best in everything. I really do, bud. Thank, thank you so much. And and you as well. Let's do it again. Yeah. I, I Eventually we'll figure out how to have incredible mood lighting like you've <laughs> had in your setup for years. I was my, actually, my my life I I painted a wall. It looks pretty good, uh, but it could look better. And uh, and I've always been very impressed with with the, your your whole entire uh, mise en scène that you have. Th- on your, thank on you. Your show. I was actually yeah. looking at your setup and saying maybe I should tone mine down. I wish has more of a business like approach, and I feel like I'm no. A, it, I'm, a, I'm a teenage I got YouTuber a sandwich over here. Board back here, you've got larger <laughs> plants than I do. It's all it's all good. <laughs> Appreciate this. Anytime.